So hello, everybody. And I'm, I'm so used to doing these in person. I much prefer that. I get to see faces and make people laugh and answer very, very specific questions, which I'll do my best from the questions in the chat. So my name is Rebecca and we, my law partner and I, Din Lu, have this law firm, both Barb and Lu. All we do is practice estate planning and elder law. So I do have some elder law um, slides in here that I will go over very quickly, uh, just because I know so many people are caring for aging relatives that I, I like to at least uh, do a little bit of elder law. So I'm going to go pretty fast. I know this is being recorded. Uh, so I always go back and, um, and listen again, but in order to get through everything, I have to talk pretty quickly. Um, other people can admit people, right? I see that up on the screen. Okay, I'm gonna ignore that part. <laughs> um, all right, so here we go. Um, so, except that's not the first slide. I don't know why I did that. I must've pushed it twice. Okay, so the roadmap for today and my goal is that I will teach you something new. I want everyone to walk away with at least one thing. Most people have a lot of things. Uh, and then encourage you to create or update your estate plan. And even those who feel like you don't need one, I think by the end, you'll realize at minimum, you need a baby estate plan. And then provide an action um, item checklist, which we will email out, and then you guys can get that later. Um, and of course, become a resource. If you have questions about estate, law, estate planning or elder law, then we can answer those questions. And if you need referrals to other experts, we have a great uh, group of people we work with uh, regularly. So, okay. So then what is an estate plan? Some of you know already and others of you don't know. So I just wanna share kind of the overview. The documents together should honor your wishes, first and foremost, avoid court, because who wants to be in court? And I think the most important in the grand scheme of things is to, of course, my phone has to ring. I only have it on because my daughter is in second grade and if something goes wrong, I need to answer it. Um, so, so most importantly is to maintain family harmony. I think that's what we all care about in the end. Unfortunately, of all the plans we see over 95%, have a fatal flaw in one of those areas, which is pretty sad because I think most people who engage with a lawyer to create these plans feel like they're going to work. And in the last, let's see, three to four years, we've had one client, we get about 130 to 175 new clients a year. And we've had one client where we reviewed the plan and they said, everything is fine. And, and they were good to go. Um, one other client recently, we reviewed the plan and everything was fine with the documents, but there was not one asset that was retitled into the trust. So the plan would have failed um, unless, you know, we did the funding. So, so one and a half clients, let's say, where, where things were okay. So what is an estate plan? So there are four main documents. The first one, and I think the most important one is the advanced healthcare directive. This is the document that legally entitles someone else to make decisions for you when you are unable, as well as naming your wishes that are all of the care preferences. And I'm going to go through a slide that talks about it, but all of your wishes to help them make better decisions, to step in your shoes um, and do as you would do for yourself if you could. The power of attorney is for everything else. So once you lose mental capacity, someone needs to be in line, ready legally to make healthcare decisions and legal and financial decisions. So that's called the baby estate plan. If you're over 18, you need it. And those of you who have kids who are 18 and older, they need them too. If something happens, you are not legally able to make those kinds of decisions. And that can be really devastating. So um, a trust and a will both say who gets your stuff when you die, but all, trust, all wills go through probate. In California, the probate process is horrendous. So we wanna avoid that at all costs. Um, and so a trust is really ideal when you have kids or assets. So it's a way to avoid probate and also 
control from the grave uh, so that you can sprinkle assets over time. They don't get everything out right. So what I always say is, you know, how to burden the people you love. The California default plan is you have nothing. You have no advanced health care directive, no power of attorney. You're headed to the court process of conservatorship. And if you have no trust, uh, you're probably headed to probate. And the best gift you can give them is a regularly updated plan. These plans are not meant to just do it one time and never address it again. Not only do the laws change, but also the people change, your wishes change. Uh, so it's important to, to maintain these. We recommend you know, every five years to, we reach out to all of our clients every five years, but obviously if you have a life-changing circumstance, then you want to uh, update it sooner. So the advanced healthcare directive in most law firms uh, is just an ancillary document. I've cared, helped to care for seven people in my family, not including my parents yet. And so I think this is the most important one. If you are not able to make decisions, you better be really clear about what your wishes are so that you're not burdening your loved one to make that decision. And worse yet, if you don't have anything headed to conservatorship. So the first part is making sure that you select the right agents. These are the people in line, the first person, second, third, whatever, um, who would be making these decisions. You wanna make sure that they are, um, no matter what, going to put their own wishes aside to honor yours. This is sometimes difficult and hopefully they're nearby or they will come here and get things sorted. They are really good zealous advocates. They will make sure that you, you know, get all the treatment you need, be in you know, different trials or whatever the circumstances are, get second opinions, all that kind of stuff. And then last, but certainly not least, be a great communicator and a harmonizer because you wanna make sure that they're communicating to other loved ones what's going on. And also that when uh, you know, you're in a hospital or in a nursing home or rehab or anything like that, that they make sure the right people are in the room taking care of you. So the effective date is important. If it is a springing power, for those of you who have these documents, if it is a springing power, which means a doctor needs to deem you incapacitated in order for it to be legally effective for your agent to make decisions. I know that's a mouthful, but if, if that's the case, we're finding it harder and harder on the elder law side when we're implementing these to get doctors to deem you incapacitated. So we make them immediately effective. When you sign the document, your agent has authority. Obviously, while well, you're fine, no doctor's gonna listen to your agent over you. We need to make sure there are HIPAA waivers and your state, um, for those of you who are not in California, um, the state equivalent. So ours is the California Medical, the CMIA, uh, Information Act. And so we want to make sure that you have those HIPAA waivers. This came into law in 2004. And so we see advanced directives up until last year uh, where they're still not including these HIPAA waivers. So legally, the medical community is not allowed to talk to you once your person has lost capacity and you're dealing with the doctors on behalf of someone. So it's really important. We talk about allergies, geriatric care managers. We have an advanced driving directive in ours. We talk about CPR. Um, and, and if you don't want CPR, the new DNR is the PULSE, the Physician's Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. We talk about quality of life, both mental and physical, because if you cross that line or that threshold and you believe you don't have quality of life, you wanna make sure your agent is knows no intervention, hospice only. So we go into great detail about that. Obviously organ donation and memorial. Um, the My Wishes is something that Din and I made up. It's essentially a laundry list of examples that clients uh, customize to their wishes of if you're not able to communicate what brings you pleasure or drives you crazy, uh, then, then this is the list to follow. And there's more, but, but just to give you an idea of how detailed these documents should be. And then um, the issues that we see all the time are the wrong people are in charge. They have co-agency. So two people are doing it together. There's no language in the document to say if one, if they disagree what happens. Um, we see these springing powers instead of immediate powers, the no HIPAA or CMIA waivers. 
lots of insufficient details. And then if there's a DNR, we really need to make sure that there's a pulse. This is the pulse. It's called the Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, but everybody calls it the pulse. Every state, not every state, almost all the states have their own version of this. Some, uh, I think it's New York, I think it's green or blue and it's called a MOLST, a Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, but there, are, it, almost every state has some version of this so that you fill it out if you do not wanna be resuscitated and you post it on the wall and follow the patient um, you know, to the hospital or to a rehab so that everywhere people know not to resuscitate. So in my line of work, you know, we hear a lot of really terrible stories, um, both ones that we deal with currently and also ones that clients share with us about another time. Uh, so we have to have some humor because otherwise I think we'd just be crying all day. Uh, so here's, here's an example of one of our clients who emailed her kids uh, about her ashes. And since, the, since she did this, she's now been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she's kind of midway through. So this was a, a long time ago. So first, uh, the email, just doing some homework for my estate plan. Do either of you want my ashes? Not to worry if you don't, but just need to know. Daughter, I do unless bro wants to split them. Son, I want the left side ashes. Daughter, that's okay because the right side's her dominant side. Son, I wanted the creative side. Daughter, okay, well, I got the gutsy, don't take no shit side, the ball side, if you will. Son, I think that's fair. So we try to be like normal humans as we're going through this process of planning. So the durable power of attorney is the other document. So now we've kind of finished the advanced directive. The durable power of attorney um, has fewer details, but the details that it does have are critically important to it working the way you intend. So first you have to pick the right agents to serve. If you've got co-agents, get rid of them, do a new one. There are more and more financial institutions that are not allowing co-agency at all. And so that presents a lot of difficulty once someone has lost capacity. How do you access the assets to even move them to a different financial institution? It's really hard. Similar to the uh, advanced directive, we talk about the effective date. For the most part, um, there are a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, we make the effective date immediate as well. And then you have to be very um, specific about the types of powers conferred. So can, if it's, if it's two spouses together, can one access the separate property of the other? Question mark. In California, we're a community property state. Um, and then second question is, can you gift? And this is a legal term of art. This means you can fix a beneficiary designation. It means you can support someone once, once this person has lost capacity and you're the agent. You, you not only have a fiduciary duty to support that person, but can you give money for you know, a, a relative this person cares for their mother, you know, already. Can you send money to their mother? Um, where we see it come up sadly a lot is where the person needs Medi-Cal planning at the end and without the power to gift, we can't gift the assets to the kids to create a plan uh, and get them qualified for Medi-Cal. And then we're just, I just told a client the other day who dad is in bad shape and daughter has been a devoted daughter and um, he doesn't have capacity anymore and the power of attorney does not enable gifting. And I said, there's just nothing we can do at this point. So it means like a property is gonna have to be sold to take care of him, but her son lives in that property. It's just, it's a nightmare. So these details are so important to get right. Uh, all right, so we see wrong agents all the time. Um, you know, this person should be the, not the procrastinator, not the one who's in financial need. It's very important that you wanna make sure the right person is accessing your money. Um, we see co-agents together. We see the springing powers again. And then, you know, the big one is there's no gifting authority. So what happens if you become incapacitated? Now, everyone thinks of this as, well, it, it doesn't happen until I'm old, but we have many clients who have early onset dementia or have had a brain injury um, of one kind or another. And so this is coming up 
more and more with younger people. So I think all of you probably remember Terry Schiavo from the 1990s. Uh, she was a young 24 or five year old, totally normal, fell down a flight of stairs, hit her head uh, and lived the last 10 years of her life like this because she did not have an advanced healthcare directive. So the image right here on the left is a normal brain. And this was Terry's brain. All of the black part is dead material in her brain. She was never going to come back. She couldn't communicate. You can tell she had a trach. Um, and her parents thought this was quality of life. So, um, for most people, this is not quality of life. And so it's very important once you're over 18, get that advanced healthcare directive done. So if you don't have an advanced directive, so we're done with the advanced directive, we're done with the power of attorney. So if you don't have the advanced directive, you don't have a power of attorney and you lose capacity and you're over 18, obviously, you're headed to conservatorship. So I created this slide long before Brittany was in the news, but the judge is deciding who takes care of you and your finances. Can you vote? Can you drive? Can, if you have a professional license, can you use it? It's super expensive. It's about 10,000 to start. And it's this permanent court intervention, which means every year we have to provide an accounting to the court, which says, which, which lays out every penny of your money that the conservator has spent or, and received. And so this is about $5,000 a year to go and pre prepare this and present it to the court and get approval. It means that for every amount of money you wanna spend that's outside of the norm, like we have one client, there's a slide later, you'll see. Um, and she, and, and, and his dad, his mom died. And so his wife said, can we send money? And I said, yeah, if we petition the court. And so, I mean, obviously it was more money to petition the court and do all of that than the money they were going to contribute. So it's just, we avoid these conservatorships if at all possible, because it's awful. So the obvious first issues that come up, no advanced directive, no power of attorney. What if the conservatee refuses? It turns into litigation against the conservatee. What if um, what this isn't on there, but what if two people are fighting over who has the power, then that's litigation. Uh, then what if the conservatee is getting into trouble? We see this all the time. There's this huge gray area of you're not incapacitated, but you're making really bad choices. You're getting scammed. You're giving money to people. And so we have to protect you against yourself. And it's this gray area of can we get the court to agree if you have capacity? Um, and so it can be very difficult. And then obviously there's financial and or physical elder abuse. So that comes up all the time as well. So this is Stacy and Vinny. I don't know, depending upon the age of all of you, um, he was a director of photography. This happened many, many years ago. Um, Stacy is his wife. They are dear friends of mine. And um, he fell off the rig as they as, on the truck as they were rounding a corner, I guess the director had said they were going to go a little bit faster and he didn't, nobody told him. And so he fell off, he hit his head, he was in a coma. Long story short, you know, they were doing their, their advanced directive, power of attorney, trust and will on, on the computer, uh, but they hadn't finished. So nothing counted. She didn't know the login to his computer, so she couldn't even access the documents if she wanted to. Uh, and then, and that's a good point to say that with all of our clients, we say, create a list of all your logins and passwords for accounts, social media, anything online, all your bills and how they get paid and from which account when they're due so that if someone has to step into your shoes, they're not scrambling to figure this out. Um, so anyway, he was in a coma. He finally woke up. Um, this is a very abbreviated version of the story. And he um, has the mental capacity of a six-year-old. She has been taking care of him for over 25 years now and still has to do the accounting to the court. They, they now allow it every two years, but, but to the penny, she still has to do that. So it's awful. So what happens after you pass away? Okay, so we've handled the advanced directive, the power of attorney. Um, 
a little bit about the the trust and the will, which I have some more to say about that. And then, you know, what happens if you pass away. So my favorite thing about this slide that I didn't notice for a long time was all the weapons they had behind them. Um, if you think people don't come out of the woodwork, you are sadly mistaken. So do you need a will versus a trust? We've established that all of you, because you're over 18, need the advanced directive and power of attorney. But what do you need in terms of a will and a trust? So if you have any real estate, you need a trust. If you have potential future beneficiaries who are young, not great with money, or may need a special needs trust, you need a trust, hands down. If not, maybe a will will suffice. So probate is triggered if you have a will or no will, and if you have over $166,250 outside of the trust. So this means that, um, that, you, that you don't have beneficiaries or transfer on death um, or joint ownership of over $166,250 in assets, then you're triggering probate. Um, we determine if there is a will, you need to have the original will, if it's valid. If not, the law of intestacy takes over, which dictates who gets what. So if you've been with your partner for 30 years, but you're not married, that person gets nothing. If you haven't spoken to your brother or sister or parent in the same number of years or even you know two years, they are going to inherit. Uh, we figure out who the executor is or the, the named um, administrator. Whatever is in, if you have a will and you say it, if that person can't qualify for a bond, they might not be the right, they might not get named as the administrator anyway. A bond is an insurance product that if the uh, administrator runs off with the money, the estate is insured. So it's super expensive. I have a slide to show you. The assets are frozen. Um, we just had uh, a new client call us a week ago and sadly um, they were they were in the midst of separating and he is in his 50s was in his 50s and died presumably of a heart attack um, so all the assets were in his name everything is going to be frozen they keep asking you know how do we pay the mortgage how do we pay for our insurance how do we pay for food like everything is frozen until there's a named administrator. Um, we have to notify all creditors in a probate and it takes a year or more. It's a completely public process. So we have to notify two layers of next of kin. So it's messy. This is essentially um, a, a fee structure. It's a whole formula. So it's just rounded up numbers. But if you have you know, an $800,000 estate your minimum probate fees will be 38,000. To determine this, they look at, at the gross estate. So if you have a house, but you have a mortgage, you don't get to subtract the mortgage. It's just the full fair market value of your house. So it goes up from there, it's, it's quite expensive. The lawyer gets half of those probate fees, the administrator gets the other half. So how to avoid it is to get a trust. This means that it's that you've selected the right people as successor trustees. Again, I would not do co-trustees um, because banks and financial institutions aren't honoring that. Uh, it has to be well-written. We see a lot of really poorly drafted trusts without the detail that's needed, um, or worse yet, it's confusing. You don't want five different lawyers reading it, coming up with five different interpretations, and you need to fund your trust. You are retitling your assets from your name to your trust name. Um, otherwise, your trust is empty, it has no assets, and you're going to end up in court. So um, as my six-year-old would say, there's the easy peasy lemon squeezy version of a trust administration where you've selected the right trustees, we get to figure out assets, debts, deal with taxes, we distribute according to the plan and the trust, and then there's family harmony, or getting blood from a stone the trustee situation is a nightmare and we are in court immediately or dealing with a lot of drama. The assets are not in the trust. In California, there's something called a Hegstead petition. So if, um, if the assets are over $166,250 outside of the trust and some of the terminology is written in the trust as it should, then we can petition the court with the Hegstead and pull it into the trust. 
All assets within that 166,000 are caught by the paper will and poured into the trust. So, but other states don't have a Hegstead. So it means that if there are assets over the limit that triggers probate in each state, then you're gonna have a full probate for all the assets that are outside of uh, the trust. So the, uh, then we deal with debts, taxes and distribution. And in the end, you know, sadly, a lot of people don't speak anymore. So a lot of the issues that we see in the will and trust department, uh, the wrong successor trustees or no trustees or executors in the will, um, the funding in the trust is incomplete. There's potential for financial abuse because of who has access to what accounts, which I will talk about in a minute. If there's a couple, um, you know, two spouses, there could be language in there that is based on kind of old law, uh, which mandates a split excuse me, when the first spouse dies, where two new trusts are born. And this is not what the family thinks. And so this is a big, big problem. There may not be a trust protector in it, um, which is likely there's no trust protector, honestly. This is a fairly new concept. We love it. We recommend it for every single client. It's a third party neutral who is not going to ever be the trustee, is not ever going to be a beneficiary. If anything goes wrong during the trust administration, then we can, as the trust protector, we can completely avoid court. The trust protector can solve all the problems um, and then we avoid the expense of court. So we love that. And then sometimes uh, there's, or often there's no temporary guardian for minor kids in the will, which means that in the event, God forbid, that both parents are incapacitated or they pass away, there's no one to step in while aunt or uncle so-and-so um, or dear friend flies in from across the country. And so we want a temporary guardian for all minors. And then I'm a huge animal person. Uh, and so we always have a pet caregiver as well. So this slide, um, I could spend like 20 or 30 minutes just going over this slide. But if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer and you can kind of read it. Um, in general, or as a nutshell, it depends who has, so who has access to what account depends on if it's in my name as an individual or in the trust name. So if an asset is in my name as an individual, my power of attorney, if it's immediate, is going to be able to access that. I wanna make sure I have the right power of attorney and I wanna make sure it's immediate. Um, and then who has the power of attorney, the actual document? We tell people don't give this document out um, for the most part and because you may change it, but also because we like to make it immediate, we don't want someone going out and using it improperly. Uh, but know that every single financial institution has their own power of attorney you have to fill out. So if your parent, let's say, is 97, now's the time to go to each one while your parent is okay, um, assuming that's the case, and fill out these powers of attorney for each one now. Uh, otherwise, when you use the power of attorney we create, they have to send it to their legal department. It takes weeks and with COVID, maybe even longer to gain access and have them approve it. So if there's a beneficiary designation on an asset in my name, that bypasses the trust unless the trust is the beneficiary. If there's none, then that, that could be a problem. If it's over the 166,000, we're looking at all assets over 166,000 together will trigger us to go to court. If there's a special needs beneficiary and, and they, he or she gets money uh, from you as the decedent, it will destroy their public benefits. So they really need to have a special needs trust set up for them in advance. Um, and then if I have an asset in my name with a spouse or a kid, I don't know that this is really honoring what the intent is behind doing that. People just add people all the time, willy nilly, not realizing a consequence of that is that when I die, that asset goes directly to that person. So it's not the same as just giving them access, it is giving them equal ownership. Um, and so this could really destroy family harmony 
Um, it can also be difficult if it's not a relative to get a death certificate. And then if you have all Benny designations or all you know, co-ownership, um, then there's not any money to administer the estate. So that can be difficult with like filing last tax returns and things like that. So there's a lot of issues that come up. Also with that is if you add someone as an owner and they get in a car accident, that PI attorney is going after your money. That's not what you intend when you add that person, I guarantee. So assets that are in the trust, meaning not just in the schedule, for those of you who have a trust, you may have a schedules, you know, A, B, and C or whatever in the back. It doesn't matter what that says. It doesn't matter that in the trust, you say this particular thing goes to this person as a specific gift. What matters is that your trust owns it. So it matters, in my case, if I have a house, I, I do a new deed and the deed says, not me as the owner, but me as the trustee of this trust can is now, the trust is the owner with me as trustee, I should say. Um, and so that's for all your assets. If you have a company, your company needs to be assigned to your trust. Um, it's very, very important to, to get the funding done correctly. Um, so there, there are other issues in terms of who has access when there's incapacity you have to get the trustee to resign. Um, and so there's details about that. I will skip for right now. So this is super important. Um, so elder law I'm just gonna touch upon is when someone starts needing help. We have plenty, we have four clients right now in their fifties with medium to advanced Alzheimer's already with early onset. Um, and then our oldest client is 97 and he plays tennis three times a week. So it's not based on age, it's based on when you need help. Uh, and, and it's about 80% therapy, just helping the family through this, uh, both from the kid's sake or you know whoever the caregivers are and also the older person and about 20% law. So over half of us, if we live over 80, will have some kind of dementia or be, and be susceptible to elder abuse. There are nine different kinds of elder abuse. We have seen every single one. And the common issues that we work on is really helping the family that's completely overwhelmed navigate the legal and financial and medical process of aging and helping someone if the elderly person is difficult or there's family drama, um, you know, we step in. If the elderly person doesn't have capacity, um, and I should really take out elderly because it, it can be so young nowadays, um, then, then conservatorship is the process. And if the person's running out of money, then we talk about usually Medi-Cal. So just a very quick snapshot of long-term care costs in California, if you have a private caregiver it, at home 24 seven, it's between 130 and $240,000 a year. If you move into an assisted living, maybe around 60 or 70, skilled nursing, 110. Um, and then the residential care is, is like a group home is less. So uh, this is all private pay. This is not Medicare. This Medicare only covers up to 100 days after a three-day hospitalization, and only if you're over 65. So Medicare is not the answer. Long-term care insurance is a great idea, in my opinion, because I see it saving estates um, all the time. And then Medi-Cal is our, our last resort. So Medi-Cal has three parts to it, the, um, the eligibility, share of costs, and recovery. But I always insert the quality of care because we have people like, we got somebody who called a week ago and said, yeah, my parents have about 2 million tied up mostly in real estate, but also other money. And they want to apply for, you know, they want they wanted us to help them qualify for Medi-Cal. And I'm like, you've got money. This, this program is not for you. Um, so quality of care is, you know, in these Medi-Cal communities, uh, the quality is not usually, depending upon the community, not as good as some of the others. There's also a VA aid in attendance. And this one um, is for veterans. We're seeing fewer and fewer of those, um, not only because the World War II veterans, are, there's not very many of them anymore, and 
the more recent wars, we haven't seen applicants, but also because they've triggered um, a three-year look back like Medi-Cal. And so as a part of that, there are fewer people eligible. We do have an end of life option act. Uh, that means that you can take your own life, but there are some very significant um, criteria that need to be followed. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to, to get this done, but there is something called the final exit network. So I would look that up if you know anyone in this position where they couldn't get qualified um, by the, the items in red. Law updates um, very quickly. Let me just see how much time do I have? Oh boy. Um, so law updates, uh, Prop 19 was the law that, that changed Prop 13 uh, among other things. And it essentially says that where we used to, when somebody passed away, be able to give real estate to the children or if there were no children to grandchildren, and not reassess the taxes, the um, property taxes, now that's not the case except for a very small loophole. So this is gonna hurt a lot of families. And there is, that was an amendment to our constitution. There is a bill that's I think circulating now to amend the constitution again, to get rid of that part. Um, Prop 19 had a lot of different parts to it. So I'm just speaking to that one. Uh, Biden has some big changes that he that the administration and if he can get you know it to be passed by the senate in the house uh will eliminate the step up and basis which is going to be a nightmare um and i'm very disappointed in that uh will decrease the federal estate or lifetime gift exemption so right now um the, in order to trigger a state tax california has no inheritance taxes just federal um they're about 10 states that have inheritance tax, but most do not. Um, and so right now you have to have $11.7 million per person uh, or over 23 million per couple uh, if you're married uh, before estate taxes are triggered. So that law will go away um, and revert back to the pre-Trump law, um, which will be about 6.4 million per person and that will take effect at the beginning of 2026. So if, but Biden might reduce it even more before that. And the number that's circulating is about three and a half million per person. And they'll increase the federal estate tax to 45%. Right now it's 40%. So you will pay, if it goes back to three and a half million without some advanced tax planning, um, you will do, you will, your estate will pay 45% of everything over three and a half million as an individual, if that's if that passes. It also proposes to increase capital gains um, and what would trigger capital gains versus uh, making it uh, ordinary income. So lots of lots of changes. We don't often have changes in my my area of law, unlike employment lawyers, which I just, I have several friends who are employment lawyers and I don't know how they do it, but those laws are literally changing like five or more times a year. So ours, ours don't change that much. So don't assume that family and friends and colleagues have an up-to-date comprehensive plan. Please talk about it. I know this is not a subject that people usually like to talk about, but it is my mission to get people talking and planning because the alternative, we are all gonna die at some point. And over half of us, if we live long enough, are going to become incapacitated. And so it's so important to not burden your family with the probate court system. It is just a nightmare. So this is a personal mission of mine to help as many people uh, to avoid the probate court system. So not only do we have the law firm, but in January, we we're launching an online version of a lot of do-it-yourself options, but this one is actually going to provide education and people are going to get documents that they need. So just a quick story. Um, we got a call about two weeks ago from a woman who said, I went on LegalZoom. Um, I created an estate plan with my friend. She was helping me because I needed the help. And so she was, you know, entering the information the way we thought it should be done. In the end, they created a trust. Uh, the friend's name is the grantor, the 
the person who has the assets to create the trust, is also the trustee, the person who manages it. There, there's no capacity issues for her friend who had these assets. So her friend obviously should have been the grantor and the trustee. Um, I'm not sure who the beneficiary was at this woman's death, the friend's death, but they transferred all the assets into this trust, which essentially gifted every single thing this woman had into this other friend's trust erroneously. And she asked like, can you guys help to fix it? So that's the worst legal zoom story, but I have heard a lot of legal zoom stories or other online stories like that. So as I said at the end, we'll, we'll send out the checklist so it can be distributed to all of you. And do you have any questions?